morning and we want to look at the Word of God and we want to consider the question, where are we now? Where are we now? The word we, the operative word there, is referring to us as Americans, as a nation. And again then with that qualification, let me ask the question, where are we now? Let us stand in honor of God's word as we have the text put on the screen for us to read together. As I read it to us, it's Acts 14, 16, and 17. The statement is made, In the past he, that is God, permitted all the nations to go their own ways. But he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. Can the church give a rousing amen? amen? Why don't you take a moment and just thank God right now for the bounties you have been a recipient of. Come on now. I believe every one of us ought to humbly just thank him today. We've been recipients of bounties that are beyond our deservings. And many of the things we've received today have not been because of what we've earned. It's been because of what God's gracious mercy has given us the lives of those who've lived godly ahead of us that God has honored. We thank you, Lord, for this nation. We thank you for our personal blessings. Remind us, God, why you gave them to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I would like to cite several different passages of Scripture this morning, and beginning with Psalm thirty-three, twelve. What the Scripture states concerning nations what joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. Psalm 9, 17 says it this way. The wicked will go down into the grave. This is the fate of all the nations who ignore God. So let me just give a warning to the United States. And if anybody perhaps is even watching this by virtue of YouTube or even on our website, I want to say to you, our nation is not exempt from God's judgment. And every nation that ignored God has become a nation of the past. And the only nation to ever become extinct for a millennia, a thousand years or more, and then arise again is the nation of Israel. And that is by the distinct covenant of Almighty God with Abraham. Uh, Proverbs 14, 34 says it this way. Godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. That one's worth bearing again. Godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. A man once visited our nation and said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And the reason he made that statement, he visited one of the churches and heard the flaming, anointing Holy Spirit speak from the pulpit. And then he understood the righteousness that undergirded and supported and gave foundation to this great nation. And that was what he was referring to in the goodness of this nation was its righteousness. In North Carolina... In our Constitution, the 1776 Constitution of North Carolina upheld religious freedom. And under Article 32, it is specifically Christian, and it specified the following qualifications for public officers in our state. And it, it says, No person who shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion or the divine authority of the Old or New Testaments, or who shall hold religious principles incompatible with the freedom and safety of the state, shall be capable of holding any office or place of trust or profit in the civil department within this state. Amen. Here's the only problem. This provision remained in effect until 1876. Where are we now?
In his book, America to Pray or Not to Pray, David Barton, who I consider to be the premier historian of America, I've never heard anyone speak more fluently and more potently concerning the nation's Christian heritage than David Barton. If you would like to look at David Barton's materials, you can do so by looking at wallbuilders.com. Wallbuilders.com. It is said that David has more historical artifacts to our nation's founding than does even our nation itself. This man is the best at what he does and is a devout Christian himself, and he lives in Texas. Makes me want to move to Texas. <laughs> but in his book, America to Pray or Not to Pray, which I picked up in the 90s, which I have a copy in my office, and I started to bring it out here today. Perhaps I should have. But he recognizes just the things in the last 60 or so years that have happened in this nation that have brought this nation to its demise. For example... 1962, the Supreme Court decision. Madeline Murray O'Hare petitioned the United States Supreme Court concerning taking prayer out of schools. It wasn't the Congress that took prayer out of school. It wasn't the president who took prayer out of school. Now get this. In each and every case that I'm going to cite here, it was the Supreme Court of the United States of America that I may go ahead and say that has overstepped its bounds and have become the most potent branch of the government when it was intended to only be a check and balance system. Our founding fathers never intended the Supreme Court to run this nation and to dictate to its people what was righteous or unrighteous, nor to, to, to legislate law. That's the legislature's position. It is the executive branch's responsibility to oversee it's the legislative branch's responsibility to develop and enact laws, and it is the judicial branch's responsibility to, to enforce them and to bring about any concerns of constitutionality to the legislative process. process. Today is the 230th anniversary of the United States Constitution, ratified on September 17, 1787. Now, that may seem a long time ago to some of you younger people, but it's only been but yesterday. But in his book by David Barton, To America to Pray or Not to Pray, he cites charts and graphs concerning since 1962 when prayer was taken out of school. Illiteracy, drug use, divorce, violent crime, teenage pregnancy, SAT scores to enter into the college arena have plummeted all of these things have now everything else has skyrocketed sat scores have plummeted all because when you do the research god was kicked out of the classroom in the united states of america Amen. ever since that time an evolutionary humanistic new age philosophy has pervaded and intruded into our school system and taught our kids that they come from animals rather than from divine origin and that there is a creator that they must answer to that holds them to righteous principles. Every state in the United States has a preamble to their constitutions. You see, the government is set up both on the federal branch and then on the, on the state-recognized rights. States' rights are important. But each state's preamble recognizes God either with the words themselves, Almighty God, Supreme Ruler of the Universe, Creator, Divine Guidance, or Guidance, Supreme Being, Sovereign Ruler, Great Legislator of the Universe, God, or Author of Existence. I don't know how, about you, but you can't get any plainer than that if you're referring to God. And the reason I bring this up is because we live in a time where people try to tell us separation of church and state. They try to tell us that our Constitution is a godless Constitution. We are not a secular state. We are a nation founded upon the Bible and godly principles. And today we want to establish that very fact. Now, before I begin I, I, in, in the sermon section itself, I want to read to you something I've read in the past. It's by a song that I heard around 1995 by a Christian choreographer and, 
and, and um, singer and performer named Carmen. How many of you ever remember watching Carmen or seeing Carmen? To me, Carmen was one of the best. He still holds, the, 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 I believe, the, uh, the title for having the most people show up at a Christian concert. It's called America Again. And it says, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Samuel Adams, first chief justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay, names synonymous with the spirit of our country, founding fathers of the USA. Over 200 years ago, they took, shook off the chains of tyranny from Great Britain by divine call. Citing 27 biblical violations, they wrote the Declaration of Independence with liberty and justice for all. But something has happened since Jefferson called the Bible the cornerstone for American liberty, then put it in our schools as a light. For since give me liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry also said our country was founded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've eliminated God from the equation of the American life, thus eliminating the reason this nation first began. From the, beyond the grave, I hear the voices of our founding fathers plead, you need God in America again. Amen. Of the 55 men who formed the Constitution, 52 were active members of their church. Founding fathers like Noah Webster who wrote the first dictionary, and by the way, they said he could quote it from Genesis to Revelation without even opening it. No wonder he was so smart. Could literally quote the Bible chapter and verse. I want to say to you young people, if you learned the Bible and never read another book in your life, you'd be the smartest, most intelligent you'll ever need to be. You read all the other books of the world and don't know the Bible, you'll be irreparably ignorant, morally deprived, and culturally unformed. We read our newspapers, we read our Inquirer magazines, we watch our televisions as though they're our educational sources. Whatever happened to this book, where are we now? James Madison said, we've staked our future on our ability to follow the Ten Commandments with all our heart. These men believed you couldn't even call yourself an American if you subverted the Word of God. In his farewell address, Washington said, you cannot have national morality apart from religious principle. And it is true. Because right now we have nearly 150,000 kids carrying guns through these war zones we call public schools. In the 40s and 50s, student problems were chewing gum and talking. Oh, how teachers and classrooms wish that were the only problems. In the 90s and up into the 2000s, rape, murder are the trend. The only way this nation can even hope to last another decade is to put God back in America again. The only hope for America is Jesus. The only hope for our country is Him. If we repent of our ways... Stand firm and say that we need God in America again. Abe Lincoln said the philosophy of the classroom in one generation will become the philosophy of government in the next. And that's exactly why we have an entitlement generation. Because they've been taught evolutionary, new age, godless philosophy. And it's all about what's in their best interest rather than what's right. And we have a government ran by those who came out of that classroom philosophy. No wonder our judges have lost their minds. No wonder somebody can sue the courts because of getting hot coffee spilled on them and win a two-point-some million dollar lawsuit. Let me just say to you, if I was the judge, I would say, ma'am, you ought to know coffee is supposed to be hot. We'll pay your medical bills. We'll give you compensation for time out of work. Thank you for coming today. Have a good day. Amen. 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 If I was a judge, I would laugh some of these people out of court and say, Get out of my court and don't you ever come back. It's ridiculous. Lawyers and litigation are killing us with prices because everything's having to be priced up because of all of the monies that are involved in litigation. Companies driven out of business because of people's frivolous lawsuits.
So when you eliminate the Word of God from the classroom and politics and even in the pulpit, you eliminate the nation that that Word protects. America is now number one in teen pregnancy and violent crime, number one in illiteracy, drug use, and divorce. And every day a new holocaust of four to 5,000 unborn children die under the guise of 1973's Roe versus Wade U.S. Supreme Court decision of abortion on demand and nobody's bothered by it anymore and when I preach about it, people get up and walk out and don't think that I should get so passionate about it but I want to say to you, there's nothing more passionate to God than the life of an innocent little baby. Where are the guts and the backbones in our pulpits anymore? Where we'd rather acquiesce to a congregation for trying to make them feel user-friendly than we would to tell them the truth. When we're afraid that we won't sell books or they won't publish our articles because we're too scripturally preaching at people. I had an editor tell me one time, said, this sounds more like a sermon it does an editorial. I said, I'm a pastor, ain't it? And it was about homosexuality that was pervading our, our culture. And I have to say, when they did publish the article, Jay Thwaite was the editor at the time in, at the Sanford Herald. And I'm going to tell you, at that time when they published it, I had people call me and say, thank you. Thank you for standing as a pastor where you do on that issue. Amen. Pornography floods our streets like an open sewer and is now available on thousands of websites accessible on somebody's phone. No wonder our young men's minds are warped. America's dead and dying hand is on the threshold of the church. And I want to say to you, 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, it was in our last week's devotions that you get each morning. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Let me just say to you, church, we need to take a good look in the mirror and ask the question, where are we now? Are we the church or we just call ourselves the church? Are we a church that suits your fancy or are we a church that suits his fancy? And which one should we be? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Him. He's the Lord. He's the Master. He's the head of the church. And we're His body. Let's act like it. While the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah vex us all, when it gets to the point that people would rather come out of the closet than clean it and want to go into a woman's bathroom when he's a man, it's a sign that God's judgment's about to fall on this nation and it has already begun to fall. Amen. If there's ever been a time to rise up, church, it's now. And as the blood-bought saints of the living God proclaim that it's time to sound the alarm from the church house to the White House and say, we want God back in America, back in our churches, back in our homes, back in our high school football assemblies, back in the pep rallies, back in our commencement ceremonies for our graduations and that we're unashamed of the name of Jesus Christ and if you don't like it then go ahead and lock us up and if you have to go ahead and kill us because we'd rather die for Jesus than to live without him. Amen. Last week I had the privilege of going to a retirement ceremony for a gentleman, Walter Waite as a matter of fact. He came to my house, I guess about two months ago, and he said, and I said, how can I help you, brother? First time he'd been to my house. He came into my kitchen area, and he said, I just want to ask you to do an invocation at my retirement ceremony. And he told me the date, and he said, I want you to be there, and I want you to do that. And also, I'd like to ask Jonathan to do the national anthem. Well, Jonathan was in Haiti, so he couldn't do this. He said, well, I guess I'll have to find somebody else. I said, well, let me suggest to you that I could fill in for that. And he said, okay. He says, you think you can handle it? I said, yeah, I think I can do that. 
So I got the privilege of doing the national anthem and doing the invocation. But you know what he said to me prior to the ceremony beginning? He retired after uh, serving 20 plus years to our United States Army. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for that. He said he came to me. He said, now I'm going to tell you something. He said, we believe around here in praying in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't pray unless I pray in his name. Just want to let you know, but thank you for letting me know. That, that definitely makes me feel good. But I can tell you, I don't pray if I don't pray in the name of Jesus. You've heard me say that. Amen. Prayer is not prayer without invoking the name of Jesus, period. Amen. It's just words. I believe that it's time for America to stand up and proclaim that one nation under God is our demand and send this evil lifestyle back to Satan where it came from and let the word of God revive our dying land. For Jesus Christ is coming back again in all his glory and every eye shall see him on that day. That's why a new anointing of God's power is coming on us to boldly tell the world you must be saved because astrology won't save you. Your horoscope won't save you. The Bible says these things are all a farce. If you're born again, you don't need to look to the stars for your answers. You can look to the very one who made those stars. History tells us that time and time again, to live like there's no God makes you a fool. And if you want to see kids live right, stop handing out condoms and start handing out the word of God again in schools. Amen. The only hope for America is Jesus. The only hope for our country is him. And it's time that our pulpits get back to preaching this truth and stop being afraid to tread into the political waters. And if people don't like you because they're a Democrat or Republican for what you say, I love you, brothers and sisters, but I'd rather please God than I would to please you. I'm not out trying to keep you in a pew. I'm trying to get you into heaven. Can I hear an amen? amen. If your religion and politics don't match, then you need to change your politics. Oh, amen to that now. Amen. Don't you call yourself a born-again Bible-believing Christian and you go into the booth and vote for somebody that kills innocent babies and endorses homosexual marriage. Don't you do it. Amen. Amen. Period. I'd like for us to pull up Isaiah 33, 22 for just a moment. I want you to look at this. Do you realize that this passage was the, was the word that our founding fathers used to develop our three branches of government? For the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. What do we have? We have the judicial branch, legislative, which is the lawmakers, and then the, the king, we have the president. Isn't that interesting? He will care for us and save us. This scripture today it provides a parallel to the three branches of government found in the United States Constitution. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our, our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. At what we call Independence Hall in Philadelphia, 55 delegates from 12 states assembled on May 25th, 1787 for the purpose of revising the inadequate Articles of Confederation. However, these delegates ended up scrapping the articles and framing a whole new governing document, the United States Constitution, which was approved 230 years ago on 7, September 17th, 1787. The result of their work over the hot summer in Philadelphia provided the framework for the longest-lasting, most successful constitutional republic in world history. Amen. Consider the fact that there are 193 countries recognized by the United States. And since 1789, look at some of these countries and compare how many constitutions they've been through compared to the U.S. Would you? Can you pull those up, Joe? The slide. Just a second. We got some screen PowerPoint stuff we want to show you here. Oh. Technical difficulty. Please stand by. You'll get it in a second. <laughs> if you get it, just let me know. 
Alexis de Tocqueville was impressed enough to speak of American exceptionalism. The results of 230 years of God's favor by giving us the Constitution, stability, and freedoms guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Alexis de Tocqueville, quote, The positions of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no other democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one. I'm going to say to you, no no other nation in the world has been granted the privileges and freedoms that we've enjoyed for 230 years. No other constitutional republic has ever lasted that long in the history of the world. Let me just say to you as well, I believe that Christianity is the reason it has. I want to say furthermore, you cannot go into an Islamic nation such as Iraq, Iran, or Pakistan, or or Afghanistan, anywhere, and try to deliver them and free them as a people and give them democratic rights when they have the Quran as their theocratic rule and try to impose democracy on that system. It won't work. Democracy only thrives, listen to me, with the Bible as at its foundation and Jesus Christ at its core. That's the only way it will thrive. While he continues to work on that, I want to just show you some things that I have. Gary DeMar's book, America's Christian Heritage. And these are available to you if you'd like to look at them sometime. Borrow them. Make, make sure you return them, please. I'd like to keep them in my library. And a DVD series, series by David Barton called the American Heritage Series. I'm going to tell you, that is an education for anybody to watch. We've watched them before here at the church years ago. Some of our documents of the Constitution and Bill of Rights. The Influence of the Bible on America by David Barton. America's Godly Heritage by David Barton. An illustrated book with documents in in facsimile within the pages of the book called Founding Fathers, The Shaping of America. Contains rare, removable facsimile documents of historical importance by Gary and Janet Souter. Just some things that I have in my own possession that I use and reference myself to learn and to develop my opinions and my beliefs and my practices. And I think you would do well to do the same in your own life. To understand the reality of what history was rather than what our history books are teaching us in the the schools of the United States right now. Can I hear an amen? Amen. I want to say to you, the United States public school system is not teaching history in its complete accuracy. It's leaving out the Christian roots of our nation and is intentionally doing so because they don't want Christ to be in the middle of the process. But I want to say to you, we need to go back and and reread and learn what our real history was. Can I hear an amen? amen? It's okay. He's not able to pull it up. Having some technical difficulty. Let me move on. America is exceptional. Why is it that this nation, above all nations, the most prosperous, the most technologically advanced, the most compassionate, the most free nation on earth at this time in history? Why? Do you think it's just because we got the biggest, baddest military? Do you think it's just because we call ourselves Americans? I'm going to ask you one question. What do you believe is the contrib- number one contributing factor to our nation's success? How many of you would agree, not just because you have to here, but would wholeheartedly agree that Jesus Christ is that one central and one primary <laughs> contributor? Consider the fact that we represent only 4.4% of the world's population. And command 41.6% of the world's wealth. 41.6%. You can go in the food line and you can walk down the cold cut aisle. And I'm going to tell you, you can find bologna, (laughs) ham, turkey, chicken. Can I hear an amen? amen? You can find some pepper jack, cheese. American cheese, Swiss cheese. You can find some Gouda cheese. By the way, that's some good cheese. I don't know if you ever ate Gouda cheese, but that's good cheese. Amen. You can find eggs and milk and orange juice and all that cold stuff. And I'm going to tell you, you can go down the next aisle and you've got cereals that you don't even know which ones to pick from because there's so many different ones. I know you probably have your favorites. 
If you ask me what mine is, I'd have to say probably some of my favorites are things like Fruity Pebbles. So. <laughs> That's why I'm so fruity, okay? How about Fruit Loops? No, I'm just kidding, okay. <laughs> All right. And you can go down any of those aisles and you can look at all of this stuff. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you've ever done this or not, but stop and look and say, wow. We give our kids all this stuff. Listen, kids, you have, you have a lot of stuff. Would you agree, now that you've been to Haiti, that you've got a lot of stuff and you're very rich? Their, their character is so much different. Absolutely. America is the birthplace of inventions like the telegraph, the telephone, the light bulb, the airplane, the internet, and the global positioning system. We have freed more people from tyranny, helped more people rebuild from the ravages of war, delivered more humanitarian aid to those who are suffering than any nation in, in the world. We are not a perfect nation. But America has been a force for good in the world, and America is still the wonder of the world. I want to ask you again today, where are we now? Let me ask you again today, are you glad to be an American? Amen. Are you thankful to live in this country? Yes. Lee Greenwood's song, If Tomorrow All the Things Were Gone, I'd Work for All My Life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. And I'm going to change a little bit. He says, I thank my lucky stars. I, I thank my God above to be living here today. The flag still stands for freedom. Here's one question. It could be taken away. The only way it's not going to be taken away is if we do four things. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. We're going to close. The only way we can retain this freedom is, is through our Lord God Almighty. He is our shield, our buckler, and he's our defender. Why is America so great? Why is America so exceptional? Kenyon Curtin makes the, he worked as, uh, with the Family Research Council, makes this comment. My argument is, for the most part, those who immigrated and settled here, those who founded and fought for our nation, and those who framed our constitutional government and Bill of Rights honored the God of the Bible. You see it in the very first charters of Jamestown and Plymouth. You see it in the fundamental orders of, the, of Connecticut and Massachusetts body of liberties, the first constitutions in America. You see it in the fact that 12 of the 13 colonies had the Ten Commandments represented in their law code. And, they, and the one who didn't, Rhode Island, had six of the ten in their law code. You see it in the multitude of the colonial proclamations for da days of prayer and fasting and days for thanksgiving and on and on I could go. Interestingly, political scientists Donald S. Lutz and Charles S. Heinemann conducted a groundbreaking study at the University of Houston by examining 15,000 documents, 2,000 of them extremely closely, written during America's founding era from 1760 to 1805, and analyzed their political content, included were political volumes, monographs, pamphlets, newspaper articles, and printed political sermons. They, the, there they found 3,154 citations or references to other sources. The source cited or quoted most often in these was the Bible. 34% of the citations from outside sources came directly from God's Word. The only ones below that hold a meager 8.3%, 7.9%, 2.9%, and the others less than 1%. So I want to say to you, overwhelmingly, the Bible is what they use to frame our nation. Amen. The Christian background of our framers, the 55 men who formed the Constitution at the convention. Every single one of them had an orthodox Christian background. Pay attention to this. Here's a breakdown. 56.4% were Episcopalian and Anglican. 29.1% were Presbyterian. 14.5% were Congregationalists. 5.5% were Quakers. 3.6% were Catholic. 3.6% were Methodist. 3.6% were Lutheran. And 3.6% were Dutch Reformed, totaling 100%. Important note, they were all sinners, though. 
How many of you have ever known a preacher to fall? How many of you read the story of 2 Samuel 11 about David? Although he's called in Acts 13 and 22 a man after God's own heart, yet he commits adultery and falls, does he not? But yet the star of David is on the flag of Israel to this day because he was the greatest king that Israel ever had, that is, humanly speaking, other than Jesus Christ himself, who is the king of Israel and of all nations. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, some had open infidelities, others were slave owners, etc. By 1787, there were, was one of the 55 who had abandoned Orthodox faith and could be considered as a Unitarian, and that was Ben Franklin. And he wrote this, though, to Reverend Dr. Ezra Stiles of Yale. Did you know that Yale, Harvard, Princeton, all were started as institutions for theological training? So that the Word of God could be adequately passed along to succeeding generations, lest they forget the God of the Bible and destroy this nation. Where, have we, where are we today? Where's Harvard? Where's Yale? Where's Princeton? It's all about trying to get this Ivy League school mentality and this prestige. But I want to say to you, they were headed up by ministers of the gospel. Today, we need educated men of God preaching from the pulpits of America without shame, without compromise, these same truths. Yet Ben Franklin used a verse from the parable of the Good Samaritan for a motto for his hospital. Proposed a picture of God enabling the children of Israel to triumph over the Egyptians as a national seal with the motto, Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Attended every kind of Christian worship, contributed to all denominations, printed sermons for and donated to the great awakening preacher, George Whitfield. He rented a pew, pew number 70, in Christ Church Anglican in Philadelphia and started the fund drive for the new steeple of the church. And he had a Christian funeral, and Ben Franklin is buried in Christ Church churchyard. Another, uh, some claim to have been Unitarian, uh, was James Wilson. Another was Hugh Wilson. But they quoted from Scripture, and they too are buried in Christian churchyards. We have been sold a bill of goods in our modern history. George Washington was not quiet about his advocacy for the Christian faith. For example, on May 2nd, 1778. Hold on, we're going to come down with this. I think this is important. Significant day we have before us here. He had charged his soldiers at Valley Forge to the distinguished character of patriot. It should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. With the convention gathered and the convention going bad and some delegates on the verge of leaving in disgust, the elder statesman Ben Franklin stands and rises to address this group who had gathered in June and then ratified the Constitution in September. They even closed the windows of the church they were in. They didn't make it public knowledge that they were gathered because they didn't want public interference and intrusion so that they could adequately hear the arguments and make a godly decision. It was hot. There was no air conditioning. Can you imagine being inside this church in the middle of June with no air conditioning and the door shut and the window shut and nobody else allowed to come out or come in and you couldn't go out till the deliberations were done and having to use an outhouse? We can't get people to come on padded pews with air conditioning. Come on now. And we think we're inconvenienced. If we had to listen to Preacher Norris preach for 45 minutes to an hour. And you've got a bathroom to go to and a padded pew to sit on and you've got nice clothes to wear and you've got air-conditioned environment and you're going to get lunch when you're done. You've got a car to drive to get there. Amen. You didn't have to ride a horse or a buggy to go. Right. All right, now, you count your blessings. Where are we now? That's right. Amen. Look at that on the positive, not just the negative. Ben Franklin rose to address the remaining delegates on June the 28th. He began talking about the fact that they had studied ancient history for models of government and those republics that have gone the way of the boneyard of history for various reasons and finally of the modern governments in Europe, but that nothing was suitable and they couldn't find any common ground. Then Franklin, who is perhaps best described as a Unitarian in his theological beliefs, made a plea that they petition God for help. Mr. President, quote, 
the small progress we have made after four or five weeks, close uh, attendance and continual reasonings with each other, our different sentiments on almost every question, several of the last producing as many no's as A's, is methinks a melancholy proof of the imperfection of the human understanding. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark, quoting Job 12, 25, to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when pre presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto or before now once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights, quoting James 1, 17, to illuminate our understanding. And we can't get people to even go vote, much less pray before they vote. Even in church meetings. Oh, come on now. Don't shout me down. No wonder we have such contention. No wonder we got such civil distress. People get right with God, we can settle all these issues. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us were engaged in the struggle, must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. To that kind of providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national felicity. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, quoting Matthew 10, 29, and Luke 12, 12 6, it is, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings. What's he talking about? He ain't talking about the Quran. He's not talking about the Quran. You can zoom in if you want. He's talking about this book, okay? And I know I may get some hate people on that. But this is the book, the holy book. The only holy book. That except the Lord build the house... Quoting Psalm 127, 1, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. Quoting Genesis 11, 1 through 9. We shall be divided by our political local interests, our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall be a reproach and a byword down to the future ages. Citing Old Testament scriptures of Deuteronomy and Jeremiah. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing governments by human wisdom and leave it to chance, war, and conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven, Nehemiah 2.4, and its blessing on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business and that one or more of the clergy of this city be requested to officiate in that service. Hereby was probably the least theologically orthodox of the framers, but he quoted the word of God better than most pastors of our time. And he called for prayer and alluded to the scriptures of the word of God. After Franklin spoke, Roger Sherman of Connecticut seconded his motion for, for prayer. And the response... Many were deeply moved. New Jersey delegate Jonathan Dayton reported, the doctor sat down, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. And never did I behold a countenance at once so dignified and delighted as was that of Washington at the close of the address. Nor were the members of the convention generally less affected. The words of venerable Frank Franklin fell upon our ears with a weight and authority even greater than we may suppose an oracle to have had in a Roman senate. That's how we got this Constitution. Yet some delegates who opposed to the motion to appoint chaplains to begin each day with prayer, led by Alexander Hamilton of New York, some of the more politically conscious thought they should have done it at the beginning. Doing it now would have a negative reflection on the convention. Franklin countered that past omission of a duty could not justify a further omission. Amen. Where are we now? You may not have been doing things right up till now. You may not have been living like you should, reading the Word and praying and going to church. But where are we now? Right. 
and that not doing it now would make the political optics ever even more worse going forward. Delegate Hugh Williamson from North Carolina was more pragmatic in his opposition. The convention had no funds to pay a chaplain. <laughs> you always got those worried about the money. Delegate Edmund Jennings Randolph of Virginia proposed his compromise measure that a sermon be preached at the request of the convention on 4th of July, the anniversary of independence, and thenceforward prayers be used in the convention every morning. Ben Franklin himself seconded the substitute motion. However, the convention voted to adjourn without the motion being acted upon. While Franklin's initial motion did not pass, ultimately it became a reality because now Congress be begins each day with a prayer by a paid chaplain. What is important to note is that Dr. Franklin's passionate plea for prayer and recess for Independence Day seemed to break the impasse. George Washington and a number of delegates followed Randolph's advice, went to Reformed Calvinist Church in Philadelphia on the 4th and heard a patriotic speech and a prayer for their deliberations led by Reverend William Rogers. Afterward, there was a change in the atmosphere of the convention and led to a breakthrough in the dele debates. Delegate Dayton Newton of New Jersey reported, quote, that we assembled again and every unfriendly feeling had been expelled and a spirit of conciliation had been cultivated. While some difficulties continued to arise before the conclusion of the convention's business in September, the delegates apparently never returned to the fruitful, fruitless bickering that had existed prior to June 28th. They formed a government that gave us the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And I want to leave you with this because there's so much more I could say. So what do we do? Number one, keep praying for it. 1 Timothy 2 says this. I urge you, first of all, pray for all, that are all, for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf for kings. Excuse me, and give, them, give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. I'm going to ask you, are you praying for the President of the United States? I'm going to say this much, and I hope they get this. I'll say to anybody, I did not vote for Barack Obama as the President of the United States because I did not agree with his, his pro-abortion, pro-homosexual agenda, and I won't vote for anybody that, that stands for that, no matter who they are. It wasn't about the color of the skin. It's about the content of their character, if I may quote Dr. Martin Luther King. Can I hear an amen? amen. They need to get back to the content of the character, not the color of the skin. That's on both sides of the aisle. All right now, pray for this for a way for kings and all are in authority that we may live peaceable and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity instead of riding in the streets and turning over cars and burning stuff and knocking over statues. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's all right. You, you can say amen there again if you want. That's, that's right. Amen. This is good. Well, he says, this is good and pleases God our Savior. What pleases God? Living a life of godliness and being a citizen that's cooperative with its authorities. Who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. What's the purpose of this nation? To be the light of carrying the gospel to a world that needs to hear it. The greatest missionary sending nation on the face of the earth has been historically the United States of America. Where are we now? Number two. Keep it prepared by defending it. Do you even know enough about your founding and your history to understand your heritage and tradition and defend this nation? It deserves to be defended. We need a good military, but most of all, we need good people reaching out to the one and only God that's able to defend us. Number three, Participate in the political process. Matthew 5.13 says this. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? What good is a church member that sits on a pew and says, Oh, I believe in Jesus, but my politics and my religion don't mix. And when I go to church, I worship Jesus. But once I leave those doors, I leave my religion inside those walls. I ask you, what good is salt if it stays inside a shaker? I ask you this, what good is light if you put a basket over top of it? 
Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Uh, it's worthless. You are the light of the world uh, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Keep rolling there. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The church and the believer are the hope of this nation. The pulpit should be the conscience of the nation. It's the pastor's job to preach to the statesman, to the politician. Are you right with God? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And have you consulted with the God of heaven concerning your legislation and your vote? And have you studied the word of God and understood its principles so that you can have the right frame of mind to even know what is right and wrong? Let me just go ahead and boldly say, a nation that's gone so amuck that we can't defund Planned Parenthood because of all this political nonsense, when they're slaughtering babies and selling their parts as an industry, we are on the threshold of death and God's judgment is looming. Defund parent, pa Planned Parenthood. It's not called Planned Parenthood. It's called Planned Murder. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Does anybody have the guts? Amen. Put me on Fox TV. Put me on ABC. I'm not after the ratings. As a matter of fact, they may get a good lot of ratings because of all the controversy it will stir up. But let me just say to you, we need to get rid of Planned Parenthood. It is the number one abortion provider in the United States. And whether people want to realize it or not, Planned Parenthood is killing even the African-American community because they're number one in the abortion industry. Amen. Amen. They're trying to extinguish people. And we don't get it. And we got preachers that are gutless and spineless and won't tell that in the pulpit. Somebody has got to be a prophet to the nation. Somebody's got to say the truth even if the world don't want to hear it. Isaiah said, no one has believed our report. He was put in a hollow log and cut in half for his faith. What are you willing to do and where are we now? Last but not least, we have got to pass this along to a future generation. Amen. Young people, I want you to come here a minute. I want this front row to just stand right here, right here beside them, if you would. Right here, right. Just line up, right straight, make a straight line. Can you? I just want to see if you can do it. Okay. All right, you guys did good. <laughs> We've given them their iPhones or their Androids or their Samsungs or whatever it may be. We've given them their clothes. We've given them their name brand shirts. We've given them their Playstations and Xboxes. We've even given our kids forty and $50,000 vehicles. But we have omitted, listen, we have omitted to give them Hear me and mark my words. If we don't get this generation back to this book, Amen. get you in this book, mark my words, you and us will face the most anarchical generation and situation in our nation that we've ever seen. If you've not seen civil disrest yet, and this nation will not survive to have a succeeding generation much further beyond. Just as the contentions face these, those men then, I'm going to ask you, are you willing to seek the God of the Bible? And are you willing to let it frame your thinking rather than YouTube, rather than television, rather than your peers and your rock music stars and your, and your movie stars and all of these supposedly important people out here? 
Are you familiar with a man named Moses? Do you know a man named Abraham? Have you heard about Jacob? Have you turned to Israel? Have you heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How about Daniel, the great man of excellent spirit? And have you especially known about the man named Jesus and what he taught? Do you know the Ten Commandments? Can any of you tell me the Ten Commandments? And I'm not trying to just embarrass you. I just want to, do any of you know the Ten Commandments by heart? You know the Twelve Disciples. Do you know all 66 books of the Bible? But how many of you could name, we'll get you here. How many of you guys could probably name, uh, let's say, 10 football players or 10 baseball players or how many ladies maybe could name certain kinds, maybe 10 different styles of clothing, shoe brands. I'm just saying. Yeah, you go, guitar strings. <laughs> I say to you, all of those things are passing, but this will never fade away. And if you want to build your life, you need to build it on this. And I'll guarantee you, listen to me, I guarantee if you do it, you, your wives and your husbands and your children will be recipients of the favor of God because you did. And you will help this nation get back to where it was rather than where we are. That's right. Amen. I'm challenging you today to do just that. Along with them today, I want you to rise with me. Are you willing to take this nation back to where it was, biblically speaking, theologically speaking. I'm not asking us to return to horses and buggies. I'm not asking us to turn off the AC and get the pads off the pews, and, and I'm not saying for us to go back to outhouses. But I am saying let's get back to the God of the Bible and back to truth, back to righteousness. Are you glad to be an American? Amen. Are you glad that you get to go today somewhere and get lunch? I know Tony is. He's going to KFC. <laughs> Amen. He owns stock there. Trust me, I wouldn't mind going there myself. But I just want to say to you today, brothers and sisters, we've been given a privilege to live in this United States of America. We have a 230-year-old constitution that's been handed us a Bill of Rights, and you and I need to stand to fight, to live, to make the difference so that we can retain that and have it for succeeding generations so that we can keep coming and telling this story. We can keep reaching the world and preaching the gospel. I wonder how many of you would just join me around the altar today, pray for our nation, and give our lives in commitment back to God and to take us back to where we ought to be rather than where we are right now. Would you come?